just to clarify before we get going, for this discussion, when I say the word liberal, I'm not referring to the left or to socialists or progressives or to democratic voters. Conversely, when I say the word conservative, I'm not referring to the right or to neocons or paleocons or to Republican voters. I'm also not referring to the Democratic or Republican parties or their liberal and conservative counterparts from other countries. I'm generally referring to the philosophies of liberalism and conservatism, which at one point were called classical liberalism and classical conservatism, though I know those terms have fallen out of style nowadays and are kind of maligned online right now, especially classical liberalism. In my video on the nature of progress, I outlined a belief that progressives and socialists hold, that history naturally moves leftward over time, and that it is not only good and correct, but inevitable for it to do so. For people who are not on the left, it's not hard to see the post-war period as a steady string of progressive victories. To the progressives, this is taken as proof that their ideas are simply superior, that they've won out in the arenas of politics and culture and economics, because the last ideology left standing after competition and experimentation has to be the best one. And in a lot of ways, this might be true. It's pretty hard, in my opinion, to argue against the moral legitimacy of things like race mixing or gay marriage, even if those things might be kind of outside the norm. Because certainly it's better for people to engage in these sorts of stabilizing institutions than not, right? The motto of the Republic of France is Liberty, Equality, Fraternity. And this motto has been taken up by liberals the world over, in fellow constitutional republics like the USA, as well as in parliamentary democracies like the UK or Canada. These are considered the virtues of liberalism, aka what liberalism brings to the table, what it considers to be the good that it is pursuing. Liberty refers to the freedom of the individual. This means freedom of self-determination, but not total freedom. You can't harm or steal or in some other way infringe on others, but you can pursue what job or education you like, regardless of race or gender or class. You can enter into what relationships you like, whether that be straight or gay or other. You can buy and sell what you like. In other words, you shouldn't be restricted in doing things that directly harm other people. Equality refers to every person being the same before God. This means that the state has an obligation to treat each person by the same standard, but not total equality. Differences in natural talent and ability will lead to unequal outcomes, but nonetheless, the playing field should be level for all. Fraternity refers to the community. During the period of the birth of liberalism, this referred to the nation, the largest possible whole of the community. If you were a Frenchman, the fraternity was France and all of her people. Despite any differences you may have with any one individual, you were all bound together by virtue of being French, and that citizenship meant something. I'm not sure if anybody has formulated this idea this way before. I haven't come across anybody who has yet, though I can't believe I'm somehow the first. Conservatism is the other side of the coin of liberalism. Unlike the revolutionary ideologies of socialism and fascism, liberalism and conservatism subscribe to the same theory of government. They just have different priorities within that framework. They both need each other in a sense. Therefore, I personally believe that it's possible to identify an inverse set of virtues that the conservative holds to in much the same way that the liberal holds to liberty, equality, and fraternity. And those virtues seem to be order, hierarchy, and family. Where liberty says freedom of self-determination, but not total freedom, that but refers to order. Order is the virtue appealed to when reasonable limits are placed on the freedom of the individual. For example, you don't have the freedom to steal from another person. Well, why not? Because it hurts them. Well, okay, but if the only thing that you're concerned with is total unrestricted personal freedom, it doesn't matter if other people are stolen from. You can steal from them, they can steal from you. But we do place limits on personal freedom, and those limits can be described as order. Where equality says every person is the same before God, but not total equality, that but refers to hierarchy. Hierarchy is the virtue appealed to when reasonable limits are placed on equality. For example, in a competition, there are winners and losers. There is inequality between the competitors, and that creates a hierarchy. A world of total unrestricted equality extends beyond simply how a power structure should treat you, but how everyone should treat everyone. There's no competition at all. So we place a limit on equality, and that limit can be described as hierarchy. Where fraternity says that despite our differences, we are all French, or Americans or Canadians, or whatever national buy-in you want, that despite refers to family. Family is the virtue appealed to when there are reasonable limits placed on fraternity. The entirety of the nation isn't your family. Your family consists of the people close to you, but the fraternity is the whole population. Your family consists of local sentimental ties, while the fraternity is made up of universalized ideological ties. I think it's reasonable to say that all of us need each of these six virtues in some quantity. Liberty and order, equality and hierarchy, fraternity and family. The liberal set is aspirational. The conservative set is grounded. You cannot go without either, at least not if you want to live a meaningful life. As I've gotten a little bit older, I've noticed two trends. First is that history moves leftward over time thing that I mentioned at the start. Second is the adage that people get more conservative as they age, which I also did a video on. 
But these two things seem to be contradictory. How can we square them away? If individuals tend to move more conservative over time, why has society moved more leftward over that same time period? Well, this is kind of anecdotal, but I think it might help anyway. At the same time as I'm writing the script for this video, I'm also collecting stream clips for a video about Destiny and the anti-SJWs, and how that dynamic shifted over time. In listening to those clips, I think I've discovered the core of the matter, that loose collection of Skype groups that I and many other YouTubers were part of during Gamergate in 2014. That was probably in the middle of the anti-SJW, atheist skeptic height on YouTube. And look at where most of the people in that broader community ended up. You've got the pure atheists, the materialists, like, for example, actual Jake or Amazing Atheist. They've since devolved into these cringy radical socialists. And then you've got people like Sargon or the Quartering, who have since become conservatives. These people all started as liberals. What happened? Why was there a shift? Did they split simply because of personality differences? Maybe. But there might be something more to it. Let's bring back those two sets of values, liberty, equality, and fraternity for the liberal, and order, hierarchy, and family for the conservative. Remember that the conservative set serves to outline the limitations of the liberal set. For example, you cannot have absolute freedom. Your freedom needs to be constrained by some semblance of order. And how much constrainment is going to be based on the give and take between those two opposing forces. So, what does a liberalism look like without any sort of opposing force constraining it? What does it mean to have liberty, equality, and fraternity unrestricted by a conservative counterbalance? It's a common phrase among socialists that socialism is the next stage beyond liberalism. If you push them on this idea, assuming that you found a socialist who's actually thought this through and is willing to talk to you about it, they'll explain that what they mean by this is the liberal promises of liberty, equality, and fraternity have not actually been fulfilled, and that socialism is simply the purer form of the ideology. Liberalism and socialism have the same virtues, but socialism promises more of those virtues within its political theory. Why should freedom be restrained by order? Socialism can offer you more freedom. For example, you should also have the freedom to own your own workplace, or maybe even all property, through a democratic system. Why not? Why should your equality be restrained by hierarchy? Socialism posits that hierarchies are unjust and need to be torn down in the name of liberation. Why not? Why should your fraternity be restrained by family? Socialism wants to expand the concept to solidarity beyond restrictive ideas like nations. We're all humans, aren't we? If we're all free and equal, why does a national barrier matter? Why should you consider any one person over any other, despite even their familial status? If you're a liberal who highly values liberty, equality, and fraternity, while at the same time rejecting order, hierarchy, and family, there's no reason you wouldn't inevitably become a socialist over time. However, if you value all six virtues, both the liberal and the conservative ones, that tug of war, that constraining element, will not allow you to become a socialist. Socialism views order, hierarchy, and family as counter-revolutionary elements, reactionary and anti-materialist concerns that people need to be re-educated out of, not virtues for people to pursue. This is why you will often see the most radical socialists explicitly praising the violation of those conservative virtues as a moral good, from the Antifa black blocker smashing up property or attacking people, to the drag queen stripper who debauches children during Pride Month, to the person who pulls the fire alarm during a speech, or tries to get their political opponents banned and fired for the things that they say. Why wouldn't you do this stuff if you were a socialist? The virtues that would restrain you, you don't consider to be virtues, while a more pure form of liberty, equality, and fraternity are served by these things. Why wouldn't you free the workers from their capitalist chains? Why wouldn't you tear down the hierarchy between adult and child? Why wouldn't you reject the people and the things that are sentimental, nostalgic, emotionally important to you? for a sense of replaceability. That is the natural end result of valuing liberty, equality, and fraternity a priori without any binding elements on them. I am, of course, not mentioning the obvious fact that socialism cannot, will not, and has never actually fulfilled any of its expanded liberal promises in reality. That's because we're talking about political theory here. We're talking about what each ideology can offer to people on paper. It's very possible that a liberal may become a socialist and never actually realize that despite having a newly heightened importance placed on those three virtues, he's actually fulfilling less of them with his actions. Because our society is honestly so prosperous that the delay in reaction time is so great, he will likely never have any negative circumstances hit him until it's too late for him to put together what's actually happening. It's kind of like how if, let's say you work for a small business, and then you steal from it, and then the business collapses because of that theft, you can easily map out that action-reaction chain. You stole a thousand dollars from the safe, the owner needed that to pay rent, the owner loses the building, the business dies. But let's say that you work for a large chain and then you steal a thousand dollars, and that just so happens to be the tipping point that causes your store to close it's going to take a lot longer for the reaction to work its way through the bureaucracy, where it might take profitability reports months to finally go through. 
And then when you get laid off way down the line, you're not going to know it was you that did it. That's a bit of a clunky analogy. But if there's a reason why socialism promises more and achieves less, while making its adherents completely oblivious as to why, it's probably something similar to that. But it's not real socialism! Of course not. It never is, and that's by design. Remember, the liberal promises are aspirational, while the conservative ones are grounded. It will never be real socialism, because socialism explicitly rejects that grounding force. It will always remain within the realm of theory, hence why you are always told to read theory by a socialist when you ask about the failed practices. So, I think this explains why some liberals become socialists. They reject the counterbalancing principle, they expel the conservative virtues, and then they either must radicalize to remain consistent, or ignore the question and not dig too deeply into their own contradictions. Now, what about the other side of it? Why do some liberals become conservatives? Well, uh, the cheeky answer is that they don't. They become liberal conservative, which, yes, is a real political philosophy. It's a form of conservatism that is strongly influenced by liberalism, which is kind of what I'm talking about when I'm describing a person who doesn't reject order, hierarchy, and family, but instead keeps them in their proper oppositional place to liberty, equality, and fraternity. But I guess if I had to answer what the question's really getting at, a person who becomes a conservative is a person who stops assuming that the liberal virtues are virtues all the time. So, for example, the liberal says, freedom's a virtue. The socialist says, great, we agree. So we're going to offer you more freedom than the liberal. And if that sounds good, then the liberal individual becomes a socialist. But a conservative might say, no, freedom isn't a virtue in all situations or circumstances. In this case, the socialist can't persuade the conservative. Simply offering more of the same will not budge him, because he's seeking something that the socialist can't provide. In fact, he's seeking something that the socialist reviles. This is what the neo-reactionary crowd calls the assumptions of liberalism. The assumption being that these liberal virtues are always good, and therefore expanding them is also always good. This ain't me simping for the NRXers. They dislike the liberal virtues too much for my taste. They've got too much order, hierarchy, and family, and not enough liberty, equality, and fraternity. But their formulation of this criticism is pretty much on point. A liberal conservative, then, is somebody who accepts the virtues of liberalism, but not a priori. He is not moved by the socialist plea to expand them endlessly, at the expense of those conservative virtues which are also valuable, because he knows that society is kept in harmony through the balance of these forces, not the privileging of one and the destruction of the other. The real problem is, this isn't a video that's really meant for my audience. You guys already get all this stuff, you're centrists. This is a video meant for the progressives who will never watch it, who are continuously bamboozled at why people are leaving the left, or why they receive such strong pushback for their ideas while simultaneously deluding themselves into thinking that they're somehow popular, or would be if they could just re-educate those working-class plebs they claim to be fighting for. It seems like, in the last century of the leftward drift, the left has lost sight of why people are conservatives, why people become conservatives, and what positive things conservatism can bring to the table. Until progressives understand what conservatives are, and what virtues that they represent that, in the eyes of normal people, the progs have abandoned, they're going to go on shadowboxing. And even worse, they're going to keep losing the match.